In the past decade, we have seen the reemergence of AI as a credible and realistic tool to be used in the description of assets, creating the opportunity for previously undiscoverable assets to be found and put to use. However, the opportunity was limited by the fact that each AI tool was an island. What was missing to fully leverage the opportunity was a platform that would allow the orchestration of selected AI tools, along with human input, into coordinated and connected workflows to produce meaningful metadata to users of these collections of digital assets. On the heels of many organizations digitizing their legacy audiovisual collections to avoid loss of their content to obsolescence and degradation, this potential solution arrived just in time. As organizations looked at the petabytes of digital files they produced from digitization, and worried about how they would ever create the metadata necessary to find, use, and preserve them, the answer was emerging in a vague way, but still remained out of reach. It was in this context that Indiana University, funded by the Mellon Foundation, conceived of, designed, and developed the audiovisual metadata platform, lovingly known as AMP. This would not only help IU figure out how to describe the 500,000 hours of audiovisual content they were in the process of digitizing, but would help countless other organizations that found themselves in a similar situation. In this episode, I have John Dunn and Emily Linema from Indiana University joining me. Both of them have been instrumental in the AMP project and will speak in detail about all aspects of this endeavor. In the spirit of the open source project that is AMP, John and Emily openly and generously share their experience, insights, and knowledge in this episode. Before we jump in, please like, follow, or subscribe to the podcast in your platform of choice. It would mean a lot. And remember, damn right, because it's too important to get wrong. John Dunn and Emily Linema, welcome to the Damn Right Podcast. I'm so excited to have you here today and to talk about uh, this really amazing project you both have been part of, uh, the AMP Project. Uh, Before we dive into um, talking about what AMP is, I'd love if you could just tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be involved with AMP. Uh, Emily, maybe we can start with you. Uh, Sure. Yeah, I can start. Uh, So I'm relatively new to the AMP project, um, but my background's in computer science, actually, in my undergraduate degree. Um, But once uh, uh, I completed that, I realized that I was interested in working with libraries and that uh, technology in libraries was a really growing area. So um, I have a master's uh, in library and information science as well, um, and I've worked in the library technology and library software development community in particular for almost 20 years now. Um, previously at NC State, now I've been at Indiana University for a couple of years, uh, almost two years now, um, and I manage product, uh, I manage developers, and I serve as the product owner for this project. Um, and so I've been busy learning as much as I can about artificial intelligence as it applies to library collections and audiovisual materials. Great. Thanks. How about you, John? I think the beginnings of my background are somewhat similar to Emily's in that, that my background is also in computer science. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in computer science. Uh, and I really got into this space actually not necessarily meaning to come into libraries or archives, but uh, through the intersection of computer science and music. Uh, so I've Well, I used to play music. Uh, I had a music minor as an undergrad. I've always had a strong interest in music, and I I took a job here at IU uh, actually 30 years ago uh, uh, this summer uh, to work on implementing a very early music streaming system uh, that was known as Variations. Uh, And that was a two-year job that has has turned into a much longer gig at this point. Uh, And a lot of my focus um, has been in kind of the area of of digital libraries, particularly working a lot with uh, audiovisual media digitization and a- online access, uh, uh, digital preservation, um, a lot of software development projects we've done with various uh, universities and other partners. And I'm now responsible for overseeing kind of m- much of our IT and digital work here in the libraries at Indiana. Um, uh, but still, my my interest uh, 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 lies a lot in these, this area of kind of media and music. Thanks for thanks for telling us about your backgrounds. Uh, can you give us the the thirty thousand foot view on what AMP is? It's basically an open source uh, software system that lets users and really you know, primarily archivists, managers of of collections of of audiovisual materials to create workflows that can combine automated steps, many of which might be based on AI or machine learning technologies, together with human intervention to really help with the 
ideally the process of creating metadata for audiovisual uh, uh, collections and, and, and assets to support their discovery, navigation, identification, uh, uh, rights determination, and other, other things that have to be done to really make these more uh, accessible, discoverable, available to the, ultimately the, the end user, be it a student, uh, a researcher, an instructor, member of the public. Uh, so we're really focused on metadata creation uh, and, and being able to support workflows to help with that creation of metadata to support discovery and usability of, of, of uh, media assets. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a discovery platform. It's not a platform for searching and browsing collections on the part of uh, end users, but really helping to feed uh, systems uh, that support that, things like library catalogs or um, archival finding aids or digital asset management systems. Who is the user that's you know, fiddling with the virtual knobs there? Is it, does this live in central IT? Does it live with the collection manager? Who does it, who's, who's using the system? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one that we're still trying to perhaps evolve the answer to. So uh, ideally it is the collection manager. So one of the, um, one of the main goals of AMP was to, to um, allow the creation of very customized workflows to support different kinds of collections. So here at IU, we have a wide diversity of um, audiovisual collections. You know, we have music performances, we have uh, ethnographic content, we have oral history interviews, we have various kinds of events, lectures, um, uh, other kinds of field collections, and the kinds of tools you'd want to apply to processing a given collection are going to vary really depending on the nature of that collection. You wouldn't want to take a concert recording and run it through a bunch of kind of speech to text uh, processing and, and try to derive metadata from that. You'd want to use other kinds of things. So ideally it's the uh, the user of the AMP platform is the collection manager. Um, but these uh, these tools, I think we'll talk more about some, some of the, we can talk more about some of the tools, but they still are kind of fiddly and, and the technical knowledge to kind of glue together uh, these different steps of the workflow is still a little, it can be a little technically difficult, so it can be challenging uh, for some collection managers to deal with. Can you paint a picture for us? You said this is not a discovery platform. It's not where people are going to search. So, you know, in the grand vision for AMP when it's doing what it does best and you really, you know, the, the vision that you have for it, wh what is it doing and what's an what is it enabling? Yeah, so really it's it's helping whoever is responsible for providing access uh, to a collection of, of audio uh, and video resources, helping them make their job easier. So it's helping them um, be able to uh, take uh, a collection of, of, of audio or video uh, materials to build a workflow that pulls in different tools to do different kinds of processing of that audio and video and perhaps existing metadata um, uh, for those materials to create information, uh, to really create new metadata that can be reviewed and used to kind of augment, augment what metadata may exist to better describe um, uh, and better make uh, audio and video resources in uh, library and archive collections discoverable. Uh, so the idea is that, you know, one could build out a different workflow, you know, as I was saying earlier, for a music collection versus a primarily spoken word collection or a different workflow for a collection of, uh, you know, video recordings of, of events of lectures on campus in certain locations um, than, uh, than the workflow that might be used for... Um, for other kinds of for a, a, a film uh, feature films or, or instructional films or TV commercials or any of the many other kinds of things that we have in our collections or that that you know any cultural heritage institution might have in its collections. So AMP generates the metadata. How how does it then get used to become discoverable? Yeah. So the idea is that the the metadata generated by AMP in partnership with a cataloger or processing archivist or or a collection manager. Uh, then uh, would feed into um, some other system. So it might uh, add, for example, subject terms to a catalog record in a traditional library uh, cataloging system. Um, 
uh, from which it could then be discovered. It might feed uh, metadata into a more AV-focused discovery system. At IU, we have a tool called Avalon that we've uh, developed with uh, some other partners in the community that we use to house our uh, AV assets, and, and it has some discovery capabilities, and uh, AMP metadata will ideally be fed into that to help enable searching to better find topics, subject matter, locations, you know, individuals uh, uh, that are associated with those recordings. And ideally, and, and we're still a little bit down the road with this, uh, at least with Avalon, not just, um, okay, you know, this topic is discussed in this two-hour lecture, but kind of to drill into really the, 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 the time in that when that uh, particular topic is discussed or whatever, whatever is searched on to be able to have metadata that is tied to the, to the, to the time, uh, timeline of the video or even maybe you know, certain spatial elements of the video as well for, for object detection. That, that's, a, I'd say, a future goal, um, but uh, really, uh, yeah, enabling that, that kind of gr more granular search ultimately in, um, in a discovery platform for the user, for the end user, for the researcher, for the student, et cetera. So AMP will generate a body of metadata, which subsets or groupings of which could be pushed to various systems that might be used for management, might be used for access and discovery. Is that, is that a correct summarization? Uh, yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's, it's information for a human to draw on to ultimately decide what would go into these systems. Um, there is a lot of discussion in the community about kind of machine generated metadata and when is it appropriate to just pull that in directly? Mm -hmm. And how do you convey? How do you convey to a user of a collection that this is machine generated versus human generated? I mean, as we know, human generated metadata is not perfect either, right? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, there are, you know, there can be issues with both. But there is, I'd say, sort of a debate about the degree to which completely machine generated metadata should be incorporated in, you know, library and archive collection descriptions where we historically have, you know. Uh, uh, very uh, relatively high attention to the the correctness of the data and what we make available. That's a very interesting discussion. Yeah, I want to and I want to zoom in on um, the human role in within AMP, uh, but uh, I'll, we'll get to that later. Maybe before we go there, it would be good to just set the stage for us at IU. Why did this project come about at IU? What was the what were the circumstances and the landscape that that made IU decide this was a project worthwhile to take on? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and a lot of people ask that question when they hear about uh, Indiana University um, uh, doing work like this. So IU is kind of a unique place. We have, for various you know reasons of our history, we have lots and lots of uh, archival collections and, and what in the library world would call special collections. Uh, across actually not just the, the libraries, but across our campus in different uh, research centers and archives and, and other units that are spread across the campus and, and on actually all seven of our, our campuses uh, in the Indiana University system. And uh, as a result, we were pretty early into the kind of realm of digitization of, um, of special collections, and in particular of, of audio and video resources. So I think I, I mentioned I joined IU back 30 years ago in the in mid-1990s, uh, and that was a project that was uh, starting to digitize uh, sound recordings held in the music library. Um, and IU has one of the largest music libraries in the country because we have one of the largest music schools, actually, one of the largest music conservatories yeah. uh, in the U.S., and so very kind of high high volume demand for uh, music uh, information resources and, and uh, music library resources. So, uh, you know, we started out kind of in this digitizing uh, music collections uh, in the 90s. We had a number of um, uh, projects funded by the National Science Foundation, National Endowment for the Humanities, the Mellon Foundation, and the 2000 focused on various aspects of uh, digitizing uh, audio and starting to digitize video collections. Uh, not just for access, but starting to look at what does it mean to use digitization as a means of preservation hey. of collections, starting to realize that many of you know, the, the formats that these uh, you know, have historically uh, been on, uh, been, been stored on, been recorded on, been played from, you know, are becoming 
increasingly difficult to, to, to play for various reasons. Uh, and uh, that then led to um, really an interest on the part of the uh, leaders of, of, uh, of the university and of our campus to get a handle on what we actually had in terms of yeah. collections because they were so kind of distributed and dispersed. So we did a survey to kind of identify, okay, what are all of the audio and video and film resources, uh, motion picture film resources we have? What formats are they on? What formats are most at risk? Uh, uh, we worked with AVP uh, uh, on that work, uh, as, as you may recall. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, this led to uh, the uh, launch of a very ambitious project back in, uh, originally announced in 2013, I think it began uh, in earnest a couple of years later, uh, called the Media Digitization and Preservation Initiative, or MDPI. And, and the goal of that project was really to digitize all of the rare and unique audio and video resources held in collections on IU's campuses. Um, and then uh, later, uh, that was uh, expanded to encompass a significant portion of our motion picture film holdings as well. But, uh, but really, the focus on AV, AV uh, largely being one of preservation, as I mentioned, um, and that generated that was digi that project has digitized over three hundred thousand media assets. It's generated um, close to twenty petabytes of data to be preserved. Some of that content was very well described with library catalog records or archival finding aids or other kinds of metadata. A lot of it wasn't, and um, we realized to actually not just preserve this and make this useful, we were going to need to um, look at kind of other ways, look, not necessarily continue what we always, all, all we had always been doing, but look at different ways we could really work to describe and, and make these materials more accessible. Yeah. So can you paint a little bit of a timeline for us? So you mentioned 2013 was the last date I heard. So kind of what was, what happened sure. between 2013 yeah. and today? Yeah, so 2013 is when this this uh, digitization initiative was announced, as I mentioned, uh, and then we began work um, in 2015, 2016 uh, on actually digitizing audio and video uh, in partnership with uh, Memnon, which uh, is a, a vendor who actually came in and set up shop uh, on our campus to do a large part of that digitization in conjunction with uh, with engineers working for IU. And uh, I think we, st I'm trying to reconstruct kind of <laughs> dates uh, in my mind, but you know, we, we started to talk about this need of um, how we, yeah, how we can describe and provide access to these materials and what, our, what users really need in terms of metadata to be able to, to find and work with collections. And uh, we actually commissioned AVP to work on a survey um, uh, or a, a study actually talking with our collection managers and about what metadata their users need and kind of mapping that out. I think that was around 2016 or so. That um, right. uh, and uh, kind of in conjunction with that, well, looking at that, it, 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 you know, it was evident that there were starting to be tools out there could act, that could actually help with some of the metadata that collection managers were saying they needed in order to, um, to you know, provide access to their collections materials. And uh, this also started to get talked about at conferences a bit, uh, you, know, a, you know, a number of conversations with other institutions, with, with partners like AVP, that yes, this actually could be something real now to, to, to really look at how we use more automation and AI uh, in workflows for making metadata, uh, which eventually then led to the birth of the AMP project in around 2017, I think. So that rough timeline gives us a sense. I mean, if we think back to you know, 2013, 2017, that era, that very much kind of the nascent stages of this new wave of AI, lots going on. Um, Still a lot of skepticism, still a lot of things to be developed. It, it, it has changed dramatically since 2017, for instance, even today. And I wonder, and you know, just for some perspective, could you tell us a bit about, like, do you have, do you recall what were, were there other platforms at the time when you came up with the concept for AMP that did similar things? Or did you come up with it because there simply weren't the, those sorts of options on the market? 
Yeah, um, that's a good question. You know, there was certainly starting to be a lot of talk about, you know, use of AI for this kind of work. Um, there, was, there were individual tools that were out there, both in the commercial and open source spaces to do particular tasks. You know, there were more tools for doing speech to text, for doing, you know, named entity recognition or other kinds of um, natural language processing or uh, detecting certain things in audio, certain kinds of events and so on. Um, but as far as systems that kind of integrated those together, there, there wasn't a lot. Hey. Um, uh, there, there was uh, uh, Gray Meta, which um, has, uh, I think recently, uh, uh, they had a system that essentially uh, uh, threw a bunch of uh, different AI tools at uh, a set of content and gave you, gave you back a lot of metadata mm -hmm. uh, to work with. Um, uh, there were starting to be tools from IBM and Microsoft that pulled more of these individual processing tools together into um, uh, uh, cloud platforms that you could uh, kind of uh, run a bunch of tools against against your content. But nothing that really took this approach of letting you build out custom workflows that were appropriate for particular kinds of collections. Yeah. Um, and so historically, uh, there have been a lot of work around in the commercial world around particular kinds of collections, like television news collections uh, being probably the biggest one, but not so much the diversity of collections that we have at a, you know, in a cultural heritage in institution. Yeah, my recollection is that, that we started talking about this concept, and I remember maybe a, you know, a few months after the, the project launch going to NAB and, and seeing Gray Meta and kind of being blown away, it felt like you know, fire being discovered in different parts of the world at the same time or something. Uh, so it did seem to be that there was this evolution, you know, in different manifestations. And I think Perfect Memory was also at the time um, doing stuff that you know, resembled, approximated this, but it was in, in, a, in a different wrapping and kind of different use cases and stuff. So a lot of early things happening at that moment in time. Um, and... I know you've de you developed this as an open source project. Was that an important aspect of you know why you thought it was important to do this instead of saying maybe going to a a gray meta at the time and saying you know we want to use your solution to solve this problem? Uh, yeah, it was. I think both both it being open source and and looking at you know eventually down the road could is this something we could build more of a community around that lets us in the the library and archive world kind of control our own. Um, kind of destiny and direction around this type of system, but also we we didn't we didn't really want something that was a black box in terms of how it functioned. We wanted to really be able to understand okay what tools are being used, what are the possibilities of those of those tools, what are the limitations uh, of those tools of those of those AI models. Um, uh, in many cases, they're being used and have some control over that rather than just throw, put content in get metadata out and uh, not be able to kind of explain to archivists, to, to librarians, to catalogers, okay, where, where did this come from? What, what, you know, how did this happen? What, what are its, what are its limitations potentially? So having that kind of control and visibility over the functioning of the system, um, I think is a big part of the interest in open source as well. Yeah. And that touches on ethical considerations, which I want to come back to. And I know that was an important aspect to this, but Emily, I wonder if we can turn to you for a bit here and and have you talk about um, what are some of the unique characteristics of AMP compared to other platforms um, that are out there that do you know, similar, and maybe not the same, but similar things? Well, John kind of already talked a bit about workflows and the idea that uh, even a collection manager or someone at that level could build a workflow that's appropriate for their needs and their collections. Um, and so one of the things about AMP is that it's, you know, it's not intended to be like a specific tool that meets a specific need, but something that can be reused time and time again to meet needs across all of our collections. Um, so we have what we call MGMs or metadata generation mechanisms in AMP that pull in um, tools from the community, both open source and commercial, and make them available to pull together into collections. Um, so this is one of the things that the project curated. So tools like for speech to text or video OCR, named entity recognition, facial recognition, even applause detection, 
Um, so you could detect distinct segments of a musical performance mm. or audio segmentation. So you can find the music or the speech versus the noise or the dead, dead sections of digitized uh, media. Um, so that was, a, that was a, a big phase of the Ant Project. So we have like a pretty large collection of those kinds of things um, pulled into the project that are made available. Um, and also um, uh, one of the last things that we built um, uh, as part of the grant funding for this project was um, the MGM evaluation framework, what we called it, was this idea that um, a collection manager or anyone really may not know for a given collection, which has its own characteristics, like John talked about, what tool is going to work best or what settings for the tool are going to work best for this tool. Okay. Um, so the idea is that um, to provide a way for uh, users to go in and test different MGMs or say test an AWS transcribe versus whisper or call the for speech text and determine if one of them is better than another for my collection. Um, and so uh, anybody really can do that after generating a ground truth for their media items, say, you know, the transcription of text, or uh, if you're doing video of OCR, a listing of the <clears throat> terminology that occurs in the video content, um, and then also run that media item through, say, AWS Transcribe or Whisper, say both probably, um, produce a transcript, and then run an automated comparison that will give you things like precision, and recall or word error rate. Mm. Um, and then, you know, also show you the comparison of like where uh, where did the automated tool produce something that differed from the human uh, produced um, ground truth. Um, so the idea is like, let's give, uh, let's give a tool to end users to be able to, to evaluate several different um, um, of these automated metadata generation um, tools within the community to figure out what's going to work best with my collection. Um, so I think that is something that's pretty unique to the um, AMP platform. Yeah, that and that seems that that ties into what John was talking about. I mean, that is a level of transparency that you, you may not, I, I haven't seen in any other platforms. So that's really interesting. That sounds like an extremely valuable um, facet of, of AMP. One of the things that strikes me as being unique about AMP um, based on my interactions with with you all over the years is just that it was built. I think, you know, we go back to when when the conversation started and there was there was a lot of skepticism on one side. On the other side, there was a lot of wide-eyed enthusiasm about what AI would do. Um, and that conversation has evolved a lot as people have put it to practice. But AMP from day one incorporated humans in the loop. Uh, and that was a core part of that. And I wonder if one of you could speak to that a little bit and just talk a bit about how you um, thought about and maybe that how that humans in the loop factored into um, AMP, uh, maybe in both kind of theoretical and practical ways. Yeah, well, we set out um, definitely not to make AMP something that people would would be fearful of in terms of replacing their jobs. And there's a lot of that kind of hype out there, perhaps now even more than there was then, yeah. you know, you know, we can just you know, use AI to describe everything. We don't need catalogers anymore. We don't need people, you know, who, who have done these types of jobs. And that's, that's very much not true. And I think will never be true because there's so much context that, um, AI models don't have, you know, may very well never have, um, that that brings value to that process, and so um, that first of all, that that was you know that was a core principle. It was you know we we very much want that that the things that humans can bring to this work to still be there, right? This is a, a way to make make their work easier, not to not to supplant them by any means, uh, and that there are steps at which we can kind of bring humans into a workflow that that really improve the overall result and it might not just be generate a bunch of metadata a human cataloger reviews and selects this is good this is bad but um you know you might generate a transcript and then have someone review that to correct it then run it through various kinds of natural language processing then then have someone s kind of select from that then try to match you know terms up with uh, vocabularies and 
um, and finally have that be reviewed again. So um, it was really we, important, we thought, to kind of both to in, engagement, willingness to engage with the tool, but, as, but also just the, quali the quality of the output and the usefulness of the output uh, eventually for, for researchers and other people who are trying to find and work with these, these collections to, to have humans uh, in the loop at multiple steps in the process. Looking for amazing and free resources about AI, DAM, and more? Let the best DAM consultants in the business help you out. Visit weareavp.com slash free hyphen resources. That's weareavp.com slash free hyphen resources. And it seems important. Humans in the loop seems like part of the answer to some of the ethical questions that come up around use of AI. Um, bias is something I know that you all have spent a lot of time looking at and, and considering. Um, and I'll just, as a side note, it seems, you know, when you talk about who we talked earlier about who, who is this tools, who is this tool in the hands of, um, it does seem that in the way, uh, having collection managers, curators uh, being the ones using the tool uh, is a human in the loop, sort of, right? They're the ones that will be most in touch with the biases associated with their subject matter. Um, so that seems interesting in and of itself that I hadn't considered before. But let's touch on the ethical considerations. Um, what are the, you know, can you give us a, a sweep of the ethical considerations that come up in a project or platform or uses of a platform like this? Sure. Yeah. And of course, there, you know, there's a lot of discussion out there now about the, uh, the ethics of AI, the biases of AI, um, uh, AI safety, uh, et cetera. But uh, really, I'd say that the two main or main sets of concerns for us in AMP have been number one, privacy. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, working with collections, particularly archival collections, um, you know, there can be a lot of people, individuals represented in those collections, things people said or did represented in those collections um, that, uh, you know, have privacy concerns where, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe some, someone knew something was being recorded, but they didn't know it would eventually be on the Internet for anyone to to discover. So some of these these privacy concerns go beyond AI and just around kind of the ethics of, hey. of making archival, archival collections available online. But then certainly um, AI has the potential to by, to improve the findability of uh, resources beyond what, you know, typically has been done. So if I could run facial recognition against, you know, everyone in a crowd of people at an event and it's telling me, oh, this person was here, this person was here, that person was there. You know, that, that goes well beyond yeah. anything we would have ever described or wanted to describe in collections in the past and not something I think people would expect or, or think, you know, certainly in, in the archival world feel uh, uh, would be ethical for us to do. So, yeah. you know, thinking about those kinds of limitations and how we use the tools and what tools we do use. Uh, also, privacy comes into play uh, in regard to using commercial tools. So there are a lot of um, cloud kind of uh, uh, AI tools for doing various kinds of processing, whether it's speech, speech to text or facial recognition, what have you from both small and large vendors out there that are available uh, and relatively easy to integrate into platforms. And we've integrated you know, several of these from uh, providers like Amazon and Microsoft, Google, uh, IBM uh, and so on, uh, but the kind of policies and practices around what those vendors do with data supplied by customers isn't always entirely uh, clear mm. or transparent, and so that's also a privacy concern. Uh, if we supply information, is that then being retained and used beyond our use of that tool to um, uh, facilitate future product improvement? better training of models, how is that stored and retained, who can get to it, um, how do we opt out of letting a vendor keep the information that we're, we're providing indefinitely, and different vendors have different policies and kind of different defaults around that, and that's, that's something that we've really looked at a lot in looking at different MGMs in the commercial side for AMP around privacy. It's only it's only recently that you started to see, oh, you can pay a few bucks more and, and not have your data go into training models, right? Emily, you were going to say something. 
I, I was just going to mention so an example, like a concrete example of what John was talking about around privacy is in the way we've implemented facial recognition in AMP, um, which is definitely concern about identifying people who may not have been aware they were being recorded again or didn't you know ever know that this recording might be surfaced. Um, so facial the facial recognition module we've implemented is one that you tell it who you want to find. So basically you provide some photos of an individual as kind of... Um, um, a, a very small training set, and you say, does this person occur within this data set? So, for example, uh, you know, we might be interested to look for Herman B. Wells um, within our collections or someone mm. like that. Um, so rather than trying to just identify anyone, you know, we're, especially for our archivists, you know, may be just trying to find materials that have an individual in them. And so it's a way to help them sort or move through collection and identify things that are of interest. Um, so it's a, it's more limited than just pointing facial recognition at a at a media item and saying, "Tell me all who all is in this," because we were definitely concerned about the implications of ethics and privacy for that particular use case. Thank you. That's a that's a useful example that helps un, help us get our head around that better. The other, I think, main kind of ethical realm of ethical concern that we looked at is bias. Obviously, you know, there's there's a lot of um, there are studies out there on kind of biases of the models that have been used to, to or the, the data that's been used to train a lot of the models that are out there mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in the AI world just because of what has been easy for researchers to obtain or, right. or who those researchers are and kind of what they naturally turn to in terms of training data. And so we also don't want AI to um, kind of amplify perhaps existing biases we may have in our own collections as well, even further through biased models that are, um, are labeling particular people you know, incorrectly or, um, uh, or working much better to provide additional metadata for some kinds of situations than for others. Uh, so that's also something we, we look closely at and, and our collection managers are very interested in. The ownership question is an interesting one. I remember talking about this years ago before. I mean, again, a recent trend has been there are companies that are founded just solely on the basis of we'll provide you your own private instance that you can train yourself with your own data and nobody else accesses it and things. At the time, that wasn't really an option. And it seemed like AMP, you know, one of the things that AMP brought to the table is this thing that people could deploy that was, you know, potentially their own private instance. Um, as you say, they're using MGMs, but as a data store, maybe they build, you know, that they build that, um, that it's theirs. Uh, and I guess I wonder, what do you think? I mean, the ownership around the data is an interesting question. There's also the model that's getting trained. There's, you know, the brain that you're, that you're training, um, and the portability of that, that, that I haven't, I haven't yet heard, and maybe I just haven't been in those conversations, but interoperability around AI models that are trained, right? Can I, can I, after using chat GPT for five years, can I take what I've trained in my own personal instance and port it over to m the next platform I want to use, or do I have to start from scratch again? Um, so I've just laid a lot out there. Sorry to do that, but maybe you could just tell, I mean, some of the, some of the thoughts or, or, or opinions around like the ownership question. Where, where, where have you been in your journey around that with related to AMP? Yeah, well, I think, you know, different people have different viewpoints around those issues and kind of what they're concerned about. Uh, one thing that we did from the start, just in terms of ownership of the models of kind of the individual steps of, of the individual MGMs, is that for almost every case, we uh, identified both a commercial cloud-hosted MGM and an open source hey. MGM implementation that one can choose from for each step. So, you know, as you suggested, uh, one could take AMP, an institution could take AMP and implement it entirely locally and only use local tools and not kind of give up their data hey. uh, to commercial providers. Uh, in some cases, the commercial tools might function better than the open source equivalents. In other cases, um, you know, it can be the other way around, uh, especially the kind of recent boom of use of Whisper for speech to text, for example, mm. which was developed by a 
company, but is is open source and has open source models. I've definitely heard institutions that that's a major reason that they want to use Whisper um, is because they want everything, you know, they have a collection that has high privacy needs for the materials or has sensitive materials, and it needs to be something that's not going to the cloud at all. We are also building up, though, I think, as you kind of alluded to, Chris, if we run AMP over time, even if we're using all these individual MGMs, we're, we're generating lots of data that um, we want to make sure is protected. And we, we want to, you know, we consider to be owned by the collection manager who's mm -hmm. running AMP. And they're the ones ultimately who decide what gets released and what doesn't, as, as we were discussing earlier. But we are building up more and more data and we have kind of the relationships between the source material and the data we're creating and potent, you know, potentially over time, the ability to train new kinds of models to kind of maybe, you know, operate more effectively on this kind of end-to-end -end, uh, uh, workflow that we're after. And uh, that's, I think, an important um, consideration of, of AMP running at, at the platform being under the control of the collect collecting organization and not just a black box living out in the world that we we have those inputs and we have those outputs and and if it becomes viable to do something uh new in the future with them that that we're the ones who decide what that is uh, and control then we being the users of the system whoever might be implementing it you've done a great job of rooting this and i use kind of use case uh for amp uh, but this project was funded by the mellon foundation or at least a few phases, I think, were funded by the Mellon Foundation. Um, and so I wonder, you know, this is clearly, they wouldn't fund something just for Indiana University. Mellon's in the business of trying to uh, help uh, kind of the greater, for the greater good. And I wonder if you could paint a picture outside of Indiana University, you know, are you running into lots of other organizations that have this same need or similar needs and, or maybe help us understand why Mellon would fund this project? Yeah, I think I think Mellon really originally funded this project out of uh, the kind of what I was mentioning earlier in the IU context, but really, you know, it's a much broader context of this growing interest in uh, an understanding of the need to preserve AV as documentation of our you know cultural heritage of, of much of the the twentieth and now twenty first centuries and. Um, kind of the fact this is not something that libraries and archives had necessarily paid a lot of attention yeah. to uh, until the last uh, last decade or so, uh, and that I use experience even even if it's at much larger scale than maybe what some other institutions might be dealing with. We all have the same problem of of AV content that has to be digitized in many cases to to be preserved to provide to be uh, accessible. And you know, the lack of metadata around that content, and this being ultimately a common need across um, across many organizations, whether uh, whether large university library systems or, or higher education institutions, um, uh, smaller local museums and archives, uh, national libraries, kind of organizations of all sizes have these kinds of collections that kind of are part of our, our cultural heritage and, and national international cultural heritage and need to be made accessible. And Mellon, um, you know, I think was uh, very interested in kind of supporting the exploration of that and, and the development of, of platforms that could help with that problem. And, and they also, at the same time they funded AMP, they funded a, a project uh, between um, uh, GBH, a public uh, broadcaster yeah. in Boston and Brandeis University to explore uh, use of AI tools focused a lot on computational linguistic tools. Mm, interesting. Um, and the kinds of the kinds of materials that uh, 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 a television, uh, public television producer like GBH has in its collections. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think Mellon uh, was trying to to help kind of jumpstart the, the the looking at these kinds of things in the in the cultural heritage and AV archiving sectors. Another takeaway from what you just said might be that, you know, for, for decades uh, or more, uh, organizations that have held collections of all sorts of materials have, have not put a ton of resources into describing them 
likely because they typically run lean and mean and don't have a lot of resources, right? It's not as if they were going and spending money on other things uh, and they had it. It's it's that they're typically pretty lean operations with limited resources and they're, it was just an enormous task. So it does seem, you know, this seemed like a moment in time and I don't want to put words in your mouth or in Mellon's, but this was an opportunity, kind of moment of reckoning as things are getting digitized. Yikes, how are we ever going to find them if we don't have metadata uh, but also what an opportunity with these new tools to to gain efficiencies and overcome the resource limitations that has have historically been found uh, does that does that sound like a fair summarization absolutely i think so and and another dimension to that i think is uh, for many organizations who had av materials in their collections um, maybe alongside other materials paper materials photographs you know et cetera AV materials were particularly challenging to deal with hey. because they are on so many different formats, because it's harder and harder to get the playback devices, et cetera. So even if they wanted to put resources into cataloging and describing them, in many cases, they couldn't even listen or watch to them to watch them to be able to to do that. And so digitization is really what enables the ability to describe infrared access uh, in a way that's that's not as much the case for for paper materials and other kinds of formats. Yeah, you start to deal with time-based metadata that you don't have to deal with with documents and images. So who else worked with you on this uh, project? That's been a really exciting part of the project is to work with so many other kind of partners and experts on helping to put this together. So uh, early on, um, we, we or since the very beginnings of the project, have worked with AVP. Um, in a number of different ways, uh, uh, providing you know help in uh, project management, uh, software development, you know subject matter expertise around metadata metadata issues, uh, uh, AV issues, user experience, um, and so on. Uh, here at IU, we've we've focused a lot on the design and and software development of the system as well, and on testing with our collections um, here at IU. But we've also worked with uh, the University of Texas at Austin um, to uh, uh, help explore different MGMs in particular hey. uh, around different kinds of audio and video processing. Uh, we've worked with New York Public Library uh, in recent phases of the project to uh, help us test the system out and, by, and test both in the context of working with collections uh, from, from New York Public Library uh, in addition to collections from IU, but also to test the system. How easy is it to install? How, how feasible is it to get running? Um, you know, what are the issues in another institution trying to take it and, and run it in its infrastructure, uh, helping make sure this isn't something that can only be used at IU. We've also had a, uh, a couple of different advisory groups of, of folks from lots of different communities, uh, archival community, library technology, uh, communities, the AI AI communities have helped kind of guide some of the initial architecture of the of the system, as well as help help us make sure that we're covering our bases um, from a number of different viewpoints as we move the system forward to something that you know will and can get used and can be sustained uh, and and so on and go beyond this this uh, kind of grant funded development effort. Yes. Speaking of UT, I just, and, and Emily, earlier you mentioned applause detection. It just makes me uh, realize uh, Tanya Clement, who is, who is part, one of the partners at UT, uh, has been working on, you know, in a related manner on HIPSTA. It was called at one point, I'm not sure if that's what it's called today, but... HIPSTAS, yeah. HIPSTAS, yeah, around, which was a, a really interesting, I, I'm assuming that that work was what, um, was one of the reasons that, that, uh, compelled you to get UT involved in the project. But um, yeah, she was, that was around poetry, right? Yeah, around looking at um, poetry audio recordings and uh, use of, um, yeah, the similar sorts of tools to some of the things we're looking at up to help with uh, supporting research use of, of those materials. Yeah. And, and so you had advisors along the way, you had project participants that brought subject matter expertise. You had project participants that brought collections that were used for testing. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that, what the testing side of this looked like? How did you work with your project partners on testing AMP? 
Yeah. So in the in the last phase, some sort of the the last phase of our project development um, that we've completed so far, um, we did several different kinds of testing. One is just user testing. Like, does this thing make any sense when a user comes to it? So um, in the last round of development, we did a lot of work with the user interface that um, a collection manager could come to and add content in and then create and run workflows and use the evaluation module that I talked about earlier for um, learning more about MGMs and how they work. Um, so we we w went through several rounds of collection managers um, and also worked with at least one or two of the folks at NYPL to provide feedback on the user interface. And um, we're in a place to kind of make some changes to try to help um, the user interface seem a little more smooth for those folks. And we had them in creating workflows um, that was one of the things that's so interesting about this project um, and the tool that we uh, we integrate an open source tool called Galaxy for allowing end users to create workflows out of these MGMs. Um, and it's amazing and wonderful tool, but sometimes uh, collection managers are a little overwhelmed when they start looking at it. So that was one of the pieces of feedback we had um, with actually creating workflows is this idea that um, we may also, there may also be a place for having kind of workflow components um, or sample mm -hmm. um, starter workflows. You know, here's the standard speech to text workflow, if that's all that you need done um, to help uh, collection managers. That was um, one piece of feedback that we got. Um, one of the, the last rounds of testing that we did was really trying to get at um, for staff who actually have collections. Um, looking at the output that is produced by MGMs and trying to determine, would this output be useful to you? What would you use this output for? Um, so uh, we talked to collection managers and came up with a set of use cases for each kind of output. So for a speech to text, like, yeah. would you be comfortable using this output produced by an MGM for full text searching? Would you be comfortable having it be actually presented to users? Would you be comfortable scanning it for keywords? Would it require human review um, before you were comfortable using it for these use cases? Or would you would you feel comfortable just using it the way it is produced by, say, AWS Transcribe or uh, Caldi is what we had at the, in place at the time? Um, or is it like not useful at all? Like I wouldn't even start with this. It's it's not helpful to me. Mm. Um, so that was a really interesting round of testing because we really wanted to try and get at you know, now that we have something built, like what can we do with it? Where's the, um, and not in the sense of like technically, what can we do with it? What tools do we have? What can they produce? But what might collection managers want to do with it? And what kinds of data are most useful that are being produced by MGMs? Um, so that was a really interesting sort of, uh, we had, we created ground truths for stuff so that we could evaluate the accuracy of Damn. outputs produced by different MGMs. And then we sort of showed that to collection managers and we had them rate it. Like, what would you be, how comfortable would you be with this output? Um, oh, interesting. And, and I, it's not particularly surprising, right? That speech to text like came up as one that a, a, you know, people, people were more comfortable leveraging because it's pretty clear how you can use a transcript. Um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and also at that time, like AWS transcribe was way better than Caldi. That, that has perhaps since changed with Whisper. We've implemented Whisper um, in uh, AMP because it's always so clearly so much better. Um, and we had done a more recent round of testing on that, and we actually chose to go with Whisper over AWS Transcribe. So um, that's been interesting, but it's also interesting to see, like, there were some tools that it was much less clear to collection managers that what was being produced was of value that they would be able to use in use on their end or that they would be comfortable with the kinds of output. So, for example, video OCR, um, uh, the output from video OCR can be challenging. It tends to have a, like a lot of excess stuff in it uh, that's not real or that's like repetition from multiple frames in video and things like that. Um, and while there may be like stuff in there that's really interesting and of value, it can feel very hard, especially from a collection manager perspective, to like sift through that raw output and be like, what would I do with this that would be useful? Um, uh, so that was that was good, and it helped to give us a sense of like, um, well, uh, where might we start with our collections and our collection managers um, to like begin to begin leveraging these tools. John mentioned testing with NYPL. 
in particular, like having them install AMP um, and go through the installation process and make sure that it was something, again, that other people could use. So that's something that actually went really smoothly um, when we worked with the folks at NYPL. So that was, um, I guess that was one of the last things we did testing-wise too. Yeah, one, one other thing to mention in this most recent um, uh, uh, phase of work that Mellon funded and the testing Emily was described, uh, we intentionally asked collection managers to focus on selecting uh, collections um, that uh, that come from, um, you know, kind of historically underrepresented groups in, in archival collections um, to, so that we could look at this in that context of, of working w uh, with uh, materials um, uh, that are perhaps a little bit more unlike some of the things that, that, that uh, some of these tools have been trained on and, and, and see how things work uh, in the, that context and explore this idea of AMP as being something that could be used to we use this pun too much probably, but amplify, you know, those voices um, uh, uh, a bit more. And this was definitely an interest of Mellon as well uh, in looking at how could, how can AI be used with, with collections involving historically underrepresented um, uh, groups while doing so in an ethical manner um, because some of the concerns we talked about earlier. Yeah, I talked to Breck de Klerk recently for the podcast and and he painted a picture for us of kind of what what the risk of loss was globally uh, for countries that had not overcome the digitization challenge many of these countries you know less less resources less wealthy um, also coincided with the founding of many of these countries in their governments and it's a really important history uh, and, and kind of painted this picture where, you know, there's a, the prospect that those materials are lost and we have this narrative that is largely shaped by what wealthy countries are able to do. What you're saying is just making me think of that because if you think, okay, everybody who has the resources to go and, and spend money on doing this thing, that is pretty complex. Uh, uh, if, if, if for those who are lesser resource, this metadata doesn't get generated, therefore it doesn't get found, therefore it doesn't make its way into books and movies and scholarship, right? So that's a, that's a really interesting um, thing to consider about on the ethical side and, and, and something that it sounds like you all tackled as far as trying to um, at least respond to that in some way. Yeah, it's still, it's still a tiny, tiny, you know, chipping away at the, at the problem uh, as, as, as you suggest, but. Um, but it raises but a, a flag. Start. It's yeah. an awareness yeah. flag, right? Like think about this. That's something for others in the field to look at and and just take note of. And um, Emily, you talked about, you've mentioned a, a few open source um, tools, uh, products that, that you've implemented or integrated with AMP, uh, Galaxy, Quality, Whisper, the ones that uh, you've mentioned. Are there others that you've incorporated that are open source uh, into AMP? Uh, well, so, I mean, uh, Galaxy is one of the big ones. So I mentioned Galaxy. Okay. Uh, Galaxy is it's an open source system for for data analysis, so authoring workflows and doing data analysis data analysis used in uh, like the genomics communities and a lot of scientific communities. Um, uh, so we pulled it in because we we're really interested in the workflow components of it. Um, so it has a, a it has, a, it has an editor that users can use. It's like a, um, a GUI editor for pulling in. You know, you just drag over the pieces that you want and use them to build a workflow. Yeah. Um, so that's one example. That's that's a significant element of the code base in AMP is bringing in. And that's a fairly large open source project. And then, like John mentioned, for every MGM that we have, one of the really important parts of the process of the project where we went through identifying tools and which ones we wanted to bring into AMP was um, looking for an open source uh, component um, to pair alongside of any commercial offering in each of the categories. Um, uh, so, you know, that's called the Whisper and Speech to Text, uh, Spacey for Named Entity Recognition, Tesseract for Video OCR, um, Pi Scene Detect uh, for Detecting Shot Detection. So we have a number of tools like that. And I guess the other thing I'll mention is, um, John mentioned human, we mentioned humans in the loop and talking about human mediated workflows where there might be human correction of outputs created by um, automated tools 
Um, so uh, in order to implement that, we pulled in, for example, the BBC editor, mm. uh, which is a, a transcript a tool for transcript correction. So after a transcript is produced by speech to text tool, um, you can use that within the context of AMP as a human to go in and review and correct that transcript. Um, and then we have a similar um, option for named entity recognition using um, using a tool that we've developed for the context of Avalon um, at IU called Timeliner. Um, so there's a number of different open source things. Of course, AMP is an open source project, so it's completely built upon open source infrastructure. Uh, right, you know, like right down to, you know, you need a server running Rocky yeah. Linux 8. But, <laughs> um, but those are some of the, the main things that we've pulled in. Right. And from the from the audiovisual archiving community, another one worth mentioning, I think, is the Ena speech segmenter that we used oh, yeah. to detect between music, speech, and silence, and, and that was developed by Ena, the the National Audiovisual Archives in France. So it's an exa good example of kind of the sharing that's starting to happen within the AV archiving community around these kinds of tools. Stay up to date with the latest and greatest from me and the Damn Right podcast by following me on LinkedIn at LinkedIn.com/in/clasinic. So what what would you say have been some of the major findings or takeaways, lessons learned um, from this project? Probably we we each have some answers to that. I'd say kind of number one finding or, or lesson uh, lesson learned, I guess, is this is not easy still, what? right? It's not easy both from the technical standpoint and pulling all these things together, but also from the human standpoint. So getting getting folks engaged, getting folks bought in. Um, uh, to the concept, uh, getting testing to happen, you know, improvements as a result of that. Uh, it, it's also challenging to scale workflows um, that involve large amounts of data still uh, uh, and lots of different tools being called on different systems. Uh, one of the things I think we didn't mention is is that we mentioned the idea of both open source and commercial and both local and cloud, but also the idea we might, uh, in a university environment, for example, you might have tools you can run in a high performance computing environment. Yeah. And those environments often are designed to work in batch sorts of modes rather than than more of an API call out and get a result yeah. back sort of mode. So there, there are technical challenges just in terms of how we integrate things. Um, yeah, getting people on board, kind of all kind of talking the same language. Uh, um, talking about what would really be useful, I think it's 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 been challenging sometimes. You know, Emily mentioned kind of what collection managers see as most useful or most immediately useful. It can be hard for people to kind of step back and think about what might be possible with, say, different kinds of discovery systems than mm -hmm. they have now. Mm -hmm. So, if you've always been focused on creating archival finding aids and creating library catalog records, you might you might start by thinking, okay, how can I make finding aids and catalog records better? Right. Um, but it can be harder to like envision a system that that uh, offers new kinds of more time-based searching and yeah. discovery. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think the areas in which the models and tools that are out there don't work as well with the kinds of collections that we have in, in libraries and archives and cultural heritage for things like detecting images of objects or, um, you know, th there's lots of room for training of models that are more appropriate to our spaces and our kinds of collections, I think. And even in some cases, specific collections. Yeah, we were, we were looking at object detection, which is not currently part of AMP, but is a use case we've been discussing with some collection managers more recently from, uh, TV ads from the 1960s. And we're like a car in the 1960s does not look exactly the same as a car from the 2000s. Um, <laughs> and, you know, definitely challenges with object detection. I, I agree with John, like the idea is to create a tool that will help people work and make their collections available more efficiently, but it, that takes time to get there, right? So you're trying to build a tool that could possibly save time or do more for, for, you, for collection managers and collection staff. But in order to get to that point, it takes um, their, collaborat their collaboration and time, um, which is always in short supply, of course. Um, I think one of the interesting things I talk about, you know, AMP is open source. It's built completely on open source. Um, and there's a lot of really cool features about Galaxy. That's been an interesting takeaway is just um, there are also limitations when you're building a good chunk of your tool upon another open source tool. 
that has uh, sometimes different use, uses, a different user community and different uses. So figuring out how to try to package um, AMP up when it's incorporating sort of some of these other, uh, this other large open source project has been an interesting challenge. Um, so this is always something to think about for every decision we make in the future as we add on. Yeah. Um, I think another interesting takeaway is just like the world is changing so fast around um, artificial intelligence tools. So Whisper came on the scene like just as we were coming to a close on the AMP project. And it is just a demonstration of like how important it is. And this is how we designed AMP is to be able to swap in new tools easily and quickly. Um, so by just making them conform to the, you know, writing some sort of wrapper around them that can conform to a standard set data set for uh, moving data around. Um, allows you to bring new tools in, but like just just the way Whisper has Eclipse called as an open source tool for speech to text transcription. I keep talking about Whisper because like that's on everybody's mind right now. Um, it just shows how like that's an important that AMP needs to continue to evolve mm -hmm. to continue to be using cutting edge tools and to be using the um, best things that work best for collection managers. What's one or two things that you'd really love to see? Uh, developed uh, or happen uh, that you haven't been able to do to date? What are, what's, what's something that you're really excited about on the horizon? Whether that be, I mean, maybe, I don't know if, you know, whether it be practical or, or theoretical. I think practically one of the things that, one of the things that we're working on really right now in emphasis is um, taking AMP and actually using it on collections that I use. So developing partnerships with collection managers to pilot this. Um, and one of the interesting things that comes out of that, and this is kind of a key takeaway too, is like the need for systems integration. Um, so where we built AMP as a tool, right, that stands alone, that you put things in, and then you can get things out of it. Um, but uh, that is, that's not the workflow that is used in processing collections. Um, there are already workflows out there. There are um, access and delivery tools. There are cataloging tools that um, collections managers are using to manage their collections. And so what we're doing right now is to try to look at what tools are already using, where are these materials available, and how can we like complete add in the systems integration so that like collection managers want to be able to just go in and say, generate a transcript for all the items in this collection and have that happen and then have them appear within our front end. So for example, for our streaming audiovisual collections, we call it media collections online. Um, to be able to just go like check a box uh -huh. and get all of that metadata sucked back in and then have it be made available to the user, you know, with a note that says like this was machine generated. So there will probably be errors in it. Um, so those kinds of like, how can we move things around in big batches and how can we integrate um, systems to support the workflows of the end users uh, who are working and processing the collections? Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's what I would like to see. What I want to see is is that's a sort of successful implementation. That's what we're working on now and, and is exciting. Well, one area I might add, and this kind of goes to back to some of my original involvement in, in this space, is I would love to go back and do more with music. Mm. So we started out in AMP working with some music collections and kind of quickly realized that there's a larger gap between the needs of music searching and the tools that are out there that can kind of be practically applied yeah. than than there was for you know collections that are more perhaps spoken word focused. Right. Um, but I would love to go back to music and be able to work more with the music information retrieval community to kind of bring some of the things that are being developed in in the research space there into reality uh, in a system like AMP uh, as far as being able to support things like you know uh, a detection of musical form or of instrumentation or. Of uh, structures of uh, being able to 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 kind of uh, uh, tie musical scores and and recordings or performances together to support searching of kind of the music itself uh, um, or you know, what what used to be referred to as query by humming uh, <laughs> as, you know for as a mode of music discovery so really going back into into focusing uh, as much on music as as we have on spoken word materials would would be exciting. Probably take another take another grant uh, or two to do. But uh. so, can you tell us what what's changed uh, in the time? You know, this has happened over a, a fairly long period of time, uh, long, especially relative to how much has happened. Uh, are there any particular milestones that you think it's important to kind of 
put a stake in the ground and, re- and use as a reference point as to what are some of the big evolutionary aspects of AI since you started this project? In the background, it's just the fact that there are so many more people doing work in this area and trying to apply these, the kinds of tools that we're working with uh, in AMP um, to, uh, to their needs and their collections. And, and that's really been great to see. Um, the, the one thing I think we really didn't anticipate going into AMP and, and actually kind of really happened after our most recent round of funding from Mellon ended is the whole LLM, you know, large language model boom, chat, BT, chat GPT, et cetera, which has really gotten people thinking about AI in much different and more expansive ways than, uh, than when we started out. And, you know, it's a little harder to see how you, you know, you don't, you can't feed audio directly, you know, or video directly to an LLM and get useful things out, but, you know, you can potentially, you know, feed transcripts and, and, uh, natural language processing output and other kinds of things. And it's been, been really interesting to see um, uh, folks start to experiment with LLMs in the context of um, uh, library and archive collections. Uh, Northwestern University has been doing some interesting work around uh, looking at applying uh, retrieval augmented generation to helping to search their digital yeah. collections. Uh, interesting. So combining an LLM with uh, vector uh, or database of kind of the metadata for the collection and the OCR and, and the transcription to kind of enable natural language sorts of uh, queries and searching the collection. I think we're going to see more and more of that. And that's that's something that we'll need to, to look at going forward as well. So uh, we hear that AMP is still a work in process. Uh, you're not done, but where would people, what would be what would people be able to find today in the way of like, you know, end products, deliverables, research papers, and, and where would they find it? We have an installable version of AMP now. We have release 101, I think it is. Um, and um, we have information on our wiki page about how that can be installed. Um, there's a GitHub uh, repository with scripting that you use to install it onto a VM uh, at your institution or onto your machine. Um, I think the URL is just go.iu.edu slash AMP. Um, and then we have a page there that's like how to get started with AMP, gives information, a uh, link to a demo video, um, information about how to install it. And then our wiki page also has a list of the MGMs that are available, um, the categories and the individual MGMs that are in it. So I think that's probably, um, there's a fair amount of documentation. There's a user guide on how you would get started. And then um, uh, GitHub, uh, the GitHub repository has a pretty extensive readme with how you would install and start running AMP. Great. And we'll put those links in the show notes. Yeah. And from that same site, you can get to um, various white papers and reports we produce that, that talk about um, kind of how we've done what we've done, why we've done what we've done, uh, if you want to dig into that more. Yes, I was. Thanks, John. I was going to mention that is the previous phases of the AMP sort of before there was releasable software. We have documented white papers um, for that to learn more about those uh, phases of the project. And what's next for AMP? What's next is, you know, we're kind of we're done with the version one development done. We're not really done with development. Um, we're, we're working on our, our technical debt kind of that accumulates when you're meeting functional goals. Um, so that's sort of the back end infrastructure upgrading things like the the view JavaScript component and the version of Postgres and things like that. Um, building delete so that people can actually delete things. Um, but then the other side of it is really, again, like collaborating with users. Um, and uh, we really wanna demonstrate um, output uses, real life use of output that we've demonstrated. Yeah, I think greater collaboration uh, with users, both in terms of collection, you know, people who have collections, whether at IU or elsewhere, but also tool developers. There's so much more happening in the cultural heritage sector around, you know, use of, of AI and machine learning. So building partnerships there, um, uh, perhaps with researchers here at IU who are working on in areas of uh, <laughs> uh, computer vision or, or machine, other types of machine learning. But also the the community that's emerging in the kind of uh, the glam mm-hmm. uh, world: galleries, libraries, archives, museums around AI. There's a AI for LAM uh, or AI numeral for LAM, AI for libraries, archives, and museums community. 
uh, that now has an annual conference that has a lot of community groups working on different things. So really plugging into, staying plugged into that, that broader world and getting hopefully more partners and, and more people uh, involved and interested in AMP and the kinds of things that we're, we're trying to do there going forward. I want to thank you both for your time. Uh, you've been very generous with your contributions and insights and the amount of thoughtfulness uh, I think you've really brought to bear today. I think, you know, I, the, the way that AI often gets talked about is so loose and, and uh, kind of dreamy. Uh, and I think that you've done a really good job of of helping us understand what a lot of the nitty gritty issues are um, that that people are grappling with. Uh, I don't think just in in Lamb and and uh, or Glam and cultural heritage is probably everywhere. I think it's a good representation. So I want to thank you for uh, being so open and and uh, transparent and and being willing to let us in and see uh, what this looks like. It's, it's, it's one of the uh, benefits of, I think, grant-funded and open-source projects is that we get to see this sort of thing. So thank you for that. Um, and to close us out, I want to ask you both the question that I ask everybody that comes on the podcast, which is, what is the last song that you liked or added to your favorites playlist? Uh, well, I can go first, which is a funny song, is uh, Believers by Imagine Dragons because my kid is singing <laughs> it for his seventh grade choir final project okay. you're, the, you're the second person that has said that their playlist is dictated in some in some way by their kids so i've got it got it and how about you john uh well i have a very nerdy answer perhaps which is uh I've been reading a book uh, by actually an IU uh, uh, emeritus uh, musicology faculty member, Peter Burkholder, about Charles Ives, mm. the early 20th century American composer who was really very experimental for his time. And so uh, uh, my answer, I guess, is uh, Leonard Bernstein, New York Philharmonic uh, performance of uh, The Unanswered Question by Charles Ives. Uh, Okay, well, 1964. Those, so those will be nice on the on the playlist right next to each other, adjacent <laughs> there. Uh, be a good good mixture. Uh, well, thank great. you both. Thank you both so much. I really appreciate your time and 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 uh, great insights today. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thank you so much for having us, Chris. This was fun.